you. Stand by for interview. Making news at 613, the shuttle Endeavour in space on the longest shuttle space mission, a 16-day mission. The purpose? To use three unique ultraviolet telescopes to study objects in space. Tonight, something very exciting. We get to talk with the astronauts right now, live, up in space. This should be fun. Before we go live to the shuttle, however, introductions are in order. We'll be talking with shuttle commander Stephen Oswald. He's 43 years old, been with NASA since 1984, and this is his third shuttle mission. And payload specialist Ronald Parise, he is also 43, and he's from Warren, Ohio. He's an astronomer, and he's been working on the Ultraviolet Imaging Telescope Project. This is his second shuttle mission. And with any luck, we're going to uh, plug in with him right now. Good evening, gentlemen. This is absolutely amazing to us that we can sit here in the newsroom and talk to you in space. Thanks for being with us. Tell us just a bit, if you would, about what your mission is and where you are in your astronomy mission, sir. Well, we're the, into the third day of, um, of this Astro Astronomy Lab, and the point of all this is to take these uh, three ultraviolet telescopes that we've got in the payload bay uh, up above the Earth's atmosphere, which shields us on the ground from uh, ultraviolet radiation. But uh, the bad part of that is, of course, we don't get to see a lot of the uh, information from uh, the celestial targets that we're looking at from the Earth. So when we take these uh, instruments up above the Earth's atmosphere into space, we can uh, get information that otherwise would be unavailable to us on the ground. We'll explain to our audience very quickly that you'll see a delay. You'll hear a delay here because they're in space, and it takes a <laughs> while for this to be transmitted. So there'll be just a moment's delay. A $200 million set of telescopes is what you're working with, we understand, and some 600 stars are going to gaze at to unlock the secrets of the universe. Can you explain what's special about these telescopes, what they can do? Uh, Ron has been working uh, on these telescopes for about the last 10 years. Let me just go ahead and pass it over to him. Thanks, Steve. The, uh, the three telescopes that we have on board, which were built at uh, Johns Hopkins University, University of Wisconsin, and Goddard Space Flight Center, um, do a lot of unique things that are not done by other ground-based observatories or space-based observatories like Hubble. Uh, for example, we have wavelength coverage into the, into the far ultraviolet, which uh, allows us to see um, a lot more of the very violent and uh, explosive events in the universe that uh, are very important for astronomers to study and understanding how the universe got to be the way it is and, and how it works. Um, we also um, have imaging capability. We have spectral capability for, for measuring temperatures and pressures and so forth. We have imaging capability to um, study the morphology or the, uh, you know, the structure of uh, galaxies and globular clusters and so forth, and it's, it's a very unique capability that's just not available anywhere else. Excuse me for not being scientific in my question here, but have you seen anything interesting so far? Are things hooked up? <laughs> well, we... Um, um, we spent the first day uh, just kind of turning everything on and making sure it was okay. Everything came up in good shape. Um, uh, a lot of the operational procedures that we have for observing these targets were things that uh, we had developed on the ground and, uh, and to, to some extent not been able to practice in detail because they work a little differently in uh, weightlessness than they do on the ground. So um, although we're still having some growing pains in uh, and getting operating here. We are getting good data. We're, um, we're observing the targets that we have scheduled. And uh, as, we, as we get coordinated here and everybody learns their job uh, a little better, we'll be, I think we'll be in fine shape. Now, we have some questions for you from the first district school in Covington. Fifth grader Deanna Carter asks, how does it feel to wear space suits for a real long time? <laughs> question from fourth grader Aaron Deller. He asks, how does it feel to lift off in a rocket 
and how does it feel to float when you're in the rocket? Well, it's, um, it's always been amazing to me the, um, the amount of energy that goes into the orbiter on the way uphill for eight and a half minutes is, uh, is just absolutely incredible. And you go through this uh, rather violent ascent, and the last uh, minute and a half or so, you're at three Gs, uh, three times the force of gravity pushing you back in the seat, uh, accelerating from about Mach 17 through about Mach 25. Uh, and then when you get to main engine cutoff, there's this instantaneous zero G. Uh, that's obviously with you until you re-enter. And that transition from uh, 3Gs to 0G, uh, and then getting used to that, uh, and the funny thing is it gets better every time you come back. You get you get used to it more quickly. Uh, but it's an incredible experience to just be able to be up here in free fall uh, for a couple of weeks and, uh, and have it seem normal, and it seems normal very quickly. That is just absolutely outrageous. It just seems so unusual for us to be able to talk to you, and we thank you. I know your time is valuable, certainly in space, and we thank you very much for sharing it with us. Stephen Oswald and payload specialist Ronald Paris, thanks very much for being with us, gentlemen. We will uh, let you get back to work. Go ahead, WKRC. Thank you. Endeavor, this is WKRC. I had one quick question for each of you. We're going to record back here. First, Mr. Oswald, did you dream of going into space as a child? Well, you know, a lot of folks that uh, that fly have had that dream since childhood. Um, I always wanted to fly. My uh, father was uh, was a Navy pilot, and always wanted to fly airplanes. But um, when I first saw the uh, Mercury capsules being taken around the country, and I saw one of those things, my dad was about six two, and uh, I knew that he wouldn't be very comfortable in there. And I figured I was going to be about his size, so I dropped that uh, that whole space thing at about age eight and didn't pick it up again until I was uh, in the Navy flying airplanes myself at the Tuxen River in uh, 1978 when the first shuttle group was selected. Uh, and then it, uh, that really got my attention, and I was lucky enough to be selected, uh, gosh, eight years later in the class of 85. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Paris, what did you see when you last looked towards Earth? How did it make you feel? Tell you what, stand by just a second. Let me get Ron on the headset here, and maybe you could repeat the question. Okay, this is Ron on the headset now. Yes, go ahead. Maurice, what did you see when you last looked towards Earth, and how did it make you feel? What did I see the last time I looked at the Earth? Yes, sir. Well, just a minute ago, I was, I'm, I'm looking at the Earth out the window right now. And um, as a matter of fact, we're, we're coming up on the coast of, uh, of South America here. And we're also coming up on the Terminator, which is that line which... Uh, uh, separates day from night. And it's quite a beautiful sight. I see a, a lot of red clouds down uh, uh, south over the Andes, and uh, we're coming across the coast of uh, looks like Peru. And it's quite a beautiful sight. The sun is shining on the clouds from the west, and it's very, very dark over in the nightlit hemisphere to the east. And uh, we'll be ourselves crossing from day to night in just a minute here. Great. Gentlemen, Thank you very much for your time. It was a pleasure. Mm -hmm. You're quite welcome. It's always our pleasure to, to talk to the folks on the ground. Houston. NPR, this is Houston. Please call Endeavor for voice check. Endeavor, this is NPR. Leanne Hansen, how do you hear me? NPR, we have you loud and clear. Good day. Good day. First, let me introduce you to our listeners. Joining us from Earth orbit are two crew members of the Space Shuttle Endeavor. Dr. Tamara Jarnigan is payload commander for the shuttle mission. Good morning, Tammy. Good morning. And Wendy Lawrence is mission specialist on the Endeavor. Good morning, Wendy. Good morning. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. 
Tammy, you're the astronomer. Give us a brief description of what you hope to achieve during the mission. Are you looking for something specific? Well, we're looking for a variety of things. Um, the instruments on board, we have uh, three instruments, and we do things like take spectra and measure polarization and do imaging of various objects, everything ranging from nearby planets to distant galaxies. Um, one of the objects we looked at today was uh, Io, which is one of Jupiter's moons, and we just have a variety of, of objects to look at in the universe, and we're studying everything from uh, local planetary phenomena, like the volcanoes that uh, we see on Io, and also uh, star formation and evolution of the galaxy and the universe, so it's quite a wide variety of topics we're covering on this flight. Will you know right away if you've seen something significant? I think um, we'll certainly have indications when we see something of significance, but it takes some time for scientists to analyze their data and to look at it carefully and make sure that they're, they're seeing what they think they see when they make their initial interpretation. So it may be a few days before, or even a few weeks, before the scientists are really ready to come out and say for certain that they've seen a phenomenon that's new and unique, or that they think they understand something in a, in a more detailed way than they did before, because they want to be careful when they do their data analysis. Any problems so far? Uh, no, actually, the, uh, the instrument pointing system we use to point our instruments to within about an arc second of accuracy is working quite well, and our instruments are performing well, so we've been very pleased. And, of course, uh, we have a very healthy space shuttle. Uh, one of the reasons that the scientists on board are able to spend their time gathering data is because the orbiter has been very healthy. Wendy, briefly tell us your role on this mission. Well, as Tammy alluded to, the uh, science data cannot be gathered unless the vehicle is performing well. So my role on the blue shift is to be in charge of the orbiter. I'm uh, technically called the orbiter pilot. Uh, in order to acquire the data, we have to do a large number of maneuvers. So in, in some ways, I'm, I'm a bus driver. I'm in charge of making sure the vehicle is where it's supposed to be, when it's supposed to be there. And on the side, I get to uh, maintain it and clean it as well. You are a naval aviator. You land helicopters on aircraft carriers. Is, this is also your first flight on the shuttle. Is it what you expected? It's even better. I've waited to do this for 25 years, and it has far exceeded my expectations. Tammy, this is your third flight. Does it get any easier with time? Well, you certainly know what to expect on your third flight in terms of um, operating in a microgravity environment. But uh, every flight is a unique one. Uh, we do something very different on each mission, and it's a pleasure to come up here and uh, perform 16 days of astronomical observations. Tammy, do you have any free time to look out the window? We have a little bit of free time. Sometimes it competes with our sleep time. It's very hard to make yourself go to sleep when you have such a wonderful view of the Earth and the stars. Have you seen any? Uh, but, uh, between uh, observations or during some of the observations, because we do all our, um, we operate our instruments from the flight deck, sometimes it's just as simple as peeking up and taking a look at the overhead or aft windows of the space shuttle to get just an incredible view of the planet. Have you seen anything memorable? I think that the view of the Earth for me is always memorable, the sunrises and the sunsets, and, and maybe I'll ask Wendy to answer that also. Go ahead, Wendy. It, it's hard to describe the sunrises and sunsets. Uh, it, the colors are beyond anything I've seen on the Earth, and uh, last night we had a pretty memorable pass over the Pacific Ocean. There were just a large area of thunderstorms that should be headed towards California here within a day or so, but just miles and miles and miles of spectacular lightning. Mm. Is it true? Can you see the Great Wall from space? Well, at our inclination, we wouldn't be able to see the Great Wall. <laughs> what else are you able to do uh, to relax? This is a very long mission for you. Do you bring books? Well, as you, as you mentioned, with uh, so much to look at out the window, uh, we probably wouldn't spend our time looking at a book. So our relaxation, we do take some music, but our relaxation is mostly in enjoying the Earth, enjoying uh, being in space, because we don't get to, to stay here very long, and so we want to take
take in all that we can. What music did you take with you? Oh, I think I've got a wide mix. I've got a little bit of uh, country. I've got some from the 60s and 70s and the, up into the 80s. And some of the other members have classical music on board. Uh, we have some special music uh, made for us by our alternate payload specialist, who's a very, very fine musician. In fact, we played that for him last night while he was working at Huntsville. Now, does NASA still wake you up for your shift with a tape of uh, music? Well, we are a dual shift flight, and so one crew is always awake. So therefore, so we have um, people sleeping and people working simultaneously. So we don't do wake up music on the dual shift flight. We broadcast all over the country. I, I might mention also that uh, one of the other crew members who's awake, who's, who's not on the radio today, is uh, Sam Durant, and Sam's busy uh, configuring our telescopes for our next observation. We're broadcasting to the country now. You have any messages for the folks back home? I think all of us are very proud to be part of this program. Um, we're here doing astronomy because we want to bring home a wealth of information about the universe we all live in, and we want to disseminate that information to the public, and we're very excited about it. Uh, we're very happy to be here. Wendy? I just think I'd like to say to the, the kids in this country that the dreams that you have as a child can, in fact, come true if you're willing to, to work hard and chase after them. And, of course, along the way, you need a lot of people to support you, and I really appreciate all the support I've gotten over the years from friends and family and teachers. Well, we'd like to take the opportunity now to invite you to come and see us when you come back down to Earth. Well, thank you very much. Dr. Tamara Jarnigan is the payload commander, and Wendy Lawrence is a mission specialist for the Space Shuttle Endeavor. It's currently in Earth orbit. They're due to land on the 17th of this month, which would make it the longest shuttle flight to date. Thanks, both of you, for taking the time to talk with us, and uh, happy landings. Thank you. Thank you very much. Here's the answer to our second space quiz. How long does it take the shuttle to get from launch pad into orbit? An amazingly fast eight and a half minutes to travel to 218 miles into space. And how fast does a signal from Television Hill get to Endeavor? <laughs> You're about to find out just how fast. It's about a half a second. Joining us live from Endeavor, Sam Durant and Wendy Lawrence. Good morning, Endeavor. Good morning, Baltimore. It's good to hear your voice. I was waiting for Wendy to speak. It's good to see you two. And what we're experiencing here is our half-second delay. Well, that's not too bad at all. We're getting you loud and clear. Very good. But there is this half-second delay because, of course, NASA is bringing the signal down to Earth. And then it's going back up into another satellite and coming down to TV Hill. So we experience a half-second half, uh, a half delay, and it can be maddening unless you're aware of that. It's kind of like long distance was before fiber optics, Sam and Wendy. Listen, we have some kids here with us in the studio because that's, that's one of the reasons we've, uh, we, we've established this link up to, to maybe uh, spur some interest in the youngsters. One day, they may be you. Uh, Mr. Mr. John Miller joins us and Miss Karina Hooker. Karina, well, welcome uh, Sam and Wendy to the show. And go ahead and ask your question, please. Well, uh, this my, my name is Corina Hooker, and I would like to ask you a question. What does a mission specialist do? She asked, what does a mission specialist do? Let me first say that there are actually two categories of astronauts. We have an astronaut pilot. They're the ones who actually fly at the controls of the shuttle, and they will land the shuttle when it's time for us to come home. And a mission specialist... Um, the specialist is kind of a, a misnomer because we actually end up being the jack of all trades and master of none. The mission specialists have the opportunity to conduct many experiments on board. In fact, the person behind me is Dr. Tammy Jernigan, who's the payload commander of this flight. She's in charge of running our primary experiment, which are three telescopes out in the payload bay. As a mission specialist, I'm in charge of some of the experiments we have down on the mid-deck. We're growing protein crystals. And on some flights, mission specialists actually have an opportunity to go outside the space shuttle and go on a spacewalk 
or perhaps fly the mechanical arm we have on board to retrieve satellites. So the mission specialists get to do a wide variety of things. It's a great job, and I really enjoy it. I'm glad to hear that. Uh, next up on our TV window, who you saw just there a minute, just there just a minute ago, is John Miller from Verda Park. John, say your question loud and clear, please. Okay. Is there a difference between the food down here on Earth and the packaged food up in space? And if there is a difference, what is it? Well, the main difference is that most of the food you have to rehydrate, meaning they take the water out of it to make it lighter and uh, make it last longer. And when you get up here, you have to put water in it. And there's a machine downstairs, which we call a rehydration station, which has a needle in it, and you put the food in there, and you inject water in it. And you either use hot water or cold water, depending on whether it's something you want hot or cold. And then you uh, mush the water around to get it to mix with the dry food. And then you eat it, and it's not bad. Most of it's uh, pretty good. You know, besides Sam and Wendy, besides having a couple of school kids in here, we also have some people uh, near and dear to your heart. Uh, Sam, your wife Becky, and your kids Ben and Susan are here joining us. Family, take it away. Yeah. Hi, Sam. We miss you. Hi, How guys. How are you doing? Dad. I was wondering if Greg is in tonight. Too. I yeah. hope you're doing <laughs> well. Dad, I was wondering if Brad could send the night Hi, tonight. Ben. Hi, Susan. Hi, Becky. Hey. Is that you, Ben? Yeah. How are you? I'm doing great. Have you been playing your guitar? Yeah, it's pretty cool. Oh, Dad, can you buy me a new amp? <laughs> <laughs> I think yeah, the one you have is just fine for right now, Ben. Uh, well, Susan, go ahead and talk to your dad. Hi, Dad. Hi, Susan. How you doing? I miss you. I miss you, too. You been having a good time? Yes. After a good night. Hi, Sam. We love you and we miss Hi. you. You look, you look I hope great. you're having a good time. Yeah, you look like you're having a good time. Becky, if I, if I can interrupt you for a second, we've got some other children's questions okay. that didn't make, uh, didn't win the contest. So Russ Miller from Arnold Elementary School, also Anne Arundel County, asked a question that I wanted to ask. Have you guys seen any space debris up there at all in the past couple of days? Uh, no, we haven't. The uh, space debris um, is very widely separated in orbit, and you very seldom see it. In fact, sometimes it's even hard to see something when you're looking very carefully for it. And it's very large. For example, the Muir Space Station, we passed within 35 miles of it the other day, and we tried as hard as we could to see it, and we couldn't see it. Because sometimes down here we get the impression, and Newsweek has an article on it this week, that there's a junkyard up there. But you haven't seen a thing. No, some of the, uh, the objects that we do get to see are actually objects that we put out in space ourselves. Uh, we have the capability to produce our own water on board, and we produce it at a rate faster than we can consume it, so periodically we'll dump that water overboard, and it instantly crystallizes into ice, and that's quite a spectacular show. In fact, we had our own snowstorm up here last night, but that, those ice crystals aren't considered a, a hazard to any other spacecraft up, up here. Well, you know, Wendy, Sam, we have another question from Deanna Gibbs from MacArthur Middle, Middle School in Fort Meade, and, and she is asking, when you look out the window and you look back at Earth, what can you see? Could you, can you identify uh, uh, Baltimore, for instance, is, if you were to fly over the area? Can you really see features on the ground well from Endeavor? Absolutely. You can, uh, unfortunately, our orbit doesn't carry us far enough north to see Baltimore, but... Uh, any of the major cities you fly over, you can recognize very easily. In fact, when you're flying over the United States at night, um, we get about as far north as Florida, but we can see all the way up the east coast, all the way up to Boston, the city lights. Wow. How about that? Wow. Hey, you know, Wendy, we, had, uh, we, we also wanted to mention to you that your dad is watching right now. The Admiral, we had a news story on him, and he is yeah. so proud of you. He almost busts his own military protocol of, of his own right stuff when speaking of you. A proud father indeed. You want to say hi to him? Sure, I'd love to say hi, Dad. 
Well, in terms of uh, the science we're doing, we've uh, observed many, many objects. And I, I couldn't tell you exactly what we've found out so far, but I know that we have uh, observed uh, over 100 astronomical objects. We're observing in the ultraviolet. We're observing uh, stars, galaxies, and looking at uh, ultraviolet light that comes from them. Uh, which doesn't reach the surface of the Earth. So we're learning a lot about the universe that we didn't know before. And while you're up there, do you ever take time to figure out the space accomplishments for us down here on Earth? Have we become like ho-hum about all this, or do we really realize the impact of every blast off? Well, we certainly realize the impact of every blast off, and I, I think... Uh, and it's an amazing accomplishment. The shuttle system is an incredible piece of technology. And I think uh, America should be proud of it. And Wendy, uh, since this is, your, this is your dream come true, did you ever as a little girl realize that space would be your office? I wanted to do this ever since I was 10 years old. I'm probably one of thousands of young people who uh, vividly remember watching Neil Armstrong take those first steps on the moon and, and said to themselves, I want to do that when I grow up. Uh, so I think I've been looking at this for the past 25 years as something that was an impossible dream, and I, I really have to thank a lot of people who helped it become an achievable goal, and it's, uh, it's, it's even better than I had hoped it would be. It's just fantastic to be in space. It is really a privilege, and the view of Earth is just so spectacular. I wish I could adequately describe it, but it's really been a treat. And Sam, looking down at us this morning, do you have a somewhat different opinion of us human beings from way up there? Well, us human beings are the same up here or down there, uh, but it does give you a feeling of uh, inspiration and awe to look at the earth from this altitude and to see how beautiful and how fragile it is. How many carry-ons are you allowed? And can you tell us what's inside your... Uh, you've brought some stuff from Baltimore and Maryland with you up into space. Can you tell the people what you brought with you? So having gone to the Naval Academy and also had an opportunity to go back there and teach and coach, I have uh, several Naval Academy items on board. I have a ball cap from the, the Navy crew team, and I'd like to give them my best. And they're doing spring break practice right now, and I hope they're rowing hard and practices are going well, and I have a Naval Academy pendant on board, and uh, I know Sam's got a couple of particular items from Baltimore that he'd like to describe. Well, I have a, a flag from Lutherville Elementary School. We made a, a contact with the amateur radio experiment with them yesterday, and when I get back, I'm going to present that to them, and I have a, a placard from uh, Cockeysville uh, Middle School that I'm taking up for them, and uh, I'm really looking forward to bringing that back and presenting it to them and with a certificate saying that it uh, has been some six million miles or so by the time we get back. Now, can you both describe what's behind you? What are we, what are we looking at? Those, not all of them, but we, won't, we only have a half an hour show. But can you tell us what, what we're looking at right behind you? Sure. This is the, uh, what we call the aft flight deck of the shuttle. Uh, right in front of us is the is the flight deck where the commander and the pilot sit. Uh, this is the station where most of the experimentation and a lot of the systems in the shuttle are controlled. Uh, this is where the controls are for the astro telescopes. And if you could see out the window, uh, the astro telescopes are right out this back window right here in the cargo bay. And uh, our teammate here, Tammy, is operating them right now, has just acquired some stars, and we're observing them right now. All right, just don't bump anything. Uh, tell us, how does this conversation work? How are my words getting to you and your words back to here? Well, it's a true mystery to me, but uh, it's the magic that Houston performs, fortunately. Uh, most of the signals from the shuttle actually are, are relayed to the ground via the satellite system that we have. And uh, there's only about a... Uh, uh, sometimes a five to ten minute period of time where we're not in contact with Houston during a 90 minute orbital pass. So uh, the world of communications has always baffled me, but I'm glad it works. How about describing your everyday occurrences? Going to the bathroom, you have to eat, you shower, you shave. Describe for us what it's like up there in space. 
Well, the one thing that you mentioned that we actually don't get to do is shower, and uh, we would love to do that. We have some uh, um, soap that we use to wash off every morning. So, uh, like, I typically shower in the morning, so when I get up in the morning, I put this uh, waterless soap on and uh, use a rag and sort of towel off. But uh, we eat and go to the bathroom just like we do on the earth. All right, any personal messages while we uh, get ready to say goodbye here? Any personal message, Wendy, Sam? I'd like to say hi to my family. lives outside of Annapolis and uh, give a hello to the Naval Academy and congratulate them on their 150th anniversary. And I'll be talking to them in a few days, I hope. And I'd just like to say hi to all my friends in Baltimore and to everyone there. And uh, I'm looking forward to coming back and seeing everybody. It's been a great well, experience. We, it's been a great experience for us this morning. We'll see you at touchdown. Thank you very much. Houston, WMAR, that concludes the event. Thank you, WMAR. And for Endeavor, we'll be taking down Air to Ground 2. KFWB, this is Houston. Please call Endeavor for a voice check. Endeavor, this is KFWB. How do you hear me? KFWB, we're on Endeavor and we read you loud and clear, Hollis. Five by five down here. And welcome aboard Endeavor. I believe uh, you're talking to a few of us up here on the flight deck, and we're orbiting the Earth 190 miles up. Good morning. Good morning, and hello from Los Angeles. Uh, Colonel Gregory, is this long mission exhausting, tedious, or tiring? You're a world-class marathoner, and now you're piloting the shuttle's all-time marathon mission. No, actually, we're having a great time up here, and it's not exhausting at all. After the first day, we got into a very nice routine and we found it quite comfortable up here, and we're also getting our exercise in, I'll point out. In fact, that's had some effect on some of the observations, we understand. Hi, it's John Grunsfeld, one of the uh, astronomer astronauts up here, and uh, actually we haven't seen very much impact of the exercise on any of the observations. We have a compensation system that takes that kind of motion out of the telescope observations. Dr. Grunsfeld, as a young astronomer, you used to trek up to mountaintop optical observatories, and now you're observing from the real mountaintop. This must be a wonder-filled experience for you. Oh, it's absolutely fantastic. And, yeah, I used to go up to uh, Mount Palomar and up to Mount Wilson and uh, observe, and this view is a whole lot better. You've worked in visible light, X-ray, gamma ray, and now this. What is it about ultraviolet that's so useful to you astrophysicists? Well, every... Uh, window in the electromagnetic spectrum has its special features that allow us to learn something about uh, stars, galaxies, black holes, neutron stars. Ultraviolet uh, is a window that allows us to look at very, very hot stars and uh, some of the more violent phenomena in the universe. It gives us a special insight into uh, what makes stars tick. The news networks may not know this yet, but you people are the hottest thing on internet ever. Your first ever online space mission may re literally reignite humankind's enthusiasm for space and exploration and science. What's your reaction to that? Well, that's great. We're really uh, happy that we're able to provide uh, a lot of this information uh, near real time to the folks on the Internet, and uh, we're glad that there's a lot of enthusiasm out there. I know we uh, provided some of the stuff uh, pre-mission that they uh, have available out there, and we're glad that they're keeping it up during the flight. What are some of the most unusual questions being sent up to you, and what's your response? Um, I'm not sure which questions uh, you're talking about. That has just been full of questions for you and, and for NASA down at Huntsville and at Johnson. I gather you oh, okay. We're not uh, we're not receiving internet questions. However, we do have the shuttle amateur radio experiment on board, and we are uh, talking to uh, a lot of school kids. And uh, uh, we've had uh, quite a few great uh, discussions with some of the kids on the ground as we fly over, and uh, some of them have had some very very uh, sophisticated astronomical questions that have surprised us all. 
Can you share any of that with us? Well, the one in particular that comes to mind was a school in India that uh, I didn't actually uh, conduct the uh, question and answer session, but Tammy Jernigan did, and she, she was uh, astounded when she was done that these, uh, these folks were asking questions about uh, black holes and the origin of the universe and uh, red shifts and so forth, and um, uh, things that, that uh, they had obviously ser done some serious homework beforehand. Now, we're seeing your video from orbit, of course, but what do you get? What do you sense that we armchair, armchair astronauts cannot see or feel? Well, as we look out the window here, we see, and I'm, I'm looking out one of the windows now, I see the, the ocean going by below us. And, um, and as a matter of fact, uh, just now, uh, a little atoll in the uh, South Pacific has uh, just crossed through the window. They go by very quickly, and uh, traveling at 17,500 miles an hour, we see a lot of the Earth go by in a very short period of time. It's a beautiful sight out there, and of course, we're also weightless up here, which is another exciting feeling. Now, this is such a long mission. Is there any anything interesting about personal hygiene? Do you tend to perspire? Do you have to take baths with wet wipes? Does your hair get dirty? And if so, from what? Well, of course, when we exercise, I've been exercising between 45 minutes and an hour each day. And when you do exercise, you're basically one big sheet of sweat by the end of it. And uh, we normally towel off first, and then we uh, bathe using a washcloth and uh, some soap that we have, no rinse soap, and we have no rinse shampoo, and we tend to dry off with a towel and throw on a new set of clothes, and we're ready to go for another day. This is Dr. Paris's second uh, journey, I guess, into space for the, the, the other two of you. This is the first time. Any surprises or observations about microgravity or life in orbit or views of the Earth or the look of the universe out the window? Well, I think the biggest surprise is that after about two days up here, it all seems very natural. Uh, floating around, tossing things to people, uh, eating, you know, all, all the things we do up here, this is really like home, and it'll be uh, a real surprise when we go back and see how quickly we adjust to being in, in 1G again. And uh, overall, it's just fantastic being up here and being able to do the kind of things that we can do uh, floating around. And the shuttle's a pretty small vehicle when we're down on the Earth. And up here, since we can utilize the whole space vertically, I'll float up a little bit, and uh, it's a, a whole lot bigger vehicle. The other big surprise is that we're here in, in daylight, and we can look down at the Earth in the South Pacific, and, uh, you know, it's just a beautiful planet. But if I look out the other window, the sky is totally black. It's a jet black, and uh, that's kind of a unique thing to be able to do. In fact, us amateur astronomers down here, Dr. Grunsfeld, um, can only be envious. Describe how black it is, what the seeing conditions are like, if you would, there. Well, in daytime, of course, our eyes have adjusted to the bright light, and... Uh, there's a, a very bright shuttle bay uh, with the telescopes behind us, and but behind it is a backdrop of just total blackness. At night, if we darken the flight deck, uh, I would say that it, the uh, the view of the stars and the Earth glow, and uh, of course Mars and Jupiter that we're able to see up here, uh, is uh, comparable to, to better than the best I've seen on any mountaintop. That's really really envy making for those of us down here on the ground. A question that I would I would wonder about, uh, you've been scheduled to get some time off. That is the ultimate human experience, to have time off to do anything you want in orbit. What have you each decided to do for yourself during your time off? Okay. Uh, basically, it's one of the few times that we can just gaze out of the windows and not have to worry about taking photos or anything else. And so I, th I think I'm just going to take in some of the viewing that goes by. It's, it's really a gorgeous sight out there, and uh, it's amazing how quickly you cover ground. To take a photograph, you, you're really working at it in the window. So just to sit back and enjoy the view, I think is probably about the best thing to do. Dr. Grunsfeld, after four billion years of Earth's existence, you and your co-investigators are at this moment raising the curtain of the universe. What does this moment mean for human history? Well, I think this is uh, a moment, both uh, what we did on Astro 1 and Astro 2, that in human history, anyway, astronomy has always played a very central role in, in civilization. And uh, we're the first wave of folks that are carrying that uh, 
part of human history to space, and someday we'll be uh, setting up observatories on the moon and Mars and, and sending out probes uh, well beyond the solar system. And so we're just the first wave of the association of astronomy with, uh, with humans. In fact, you may unlock with what you bring back with you the secrets to how the universe began. That's very awesome, isn't it? This must be quite a responsibility and, and a thrilling feeling for you guys. Well, it's just part of the everyday work of uh, an astronomer or an astrophysicist, and it is very exciting. I wonder if you feel like you're in free fall. For those of us who have not been in orbit, you're noticeably taller, and your faces are a little bit toughier than they were two weeks ago or two weeks from now, aren't they? Yes, that's true. Basically, uh, when you're standing on Earth, you've got gravity pulling all the blood into your extremities, your arms and your legs, and as soon as we get to zero G, all of that fluid starts seeping to your midsection and your face. So our stomachs kind of bulge out a bit, and our faces tend to puff out. But after a couple of days, it starts going down. So they look a lot better now than they did immediately after uh, Miko. Now, you've helped us a lot with what it looks like, but what does it sound, taste, feel, and smell like in the orbiter? Well, it smells okay to us. <laughs> We're used to it. No, it smells fine. Everything tastes good. The food tastes good. Some people like different things from uh, what they're used to on Earth. And uh, as far as the way it feels, after about the first day, it feels extremely natural. At first, moving around, you're, you're a little bit unsteady and wobbly. But uh, after a day or so, it feels completely natural. The rules of personal conduct, I guess, are a little bit different on orbit, aren't they? For example, I imagine you bump into each other a little bit more, probably don't even say excuse me anymore if you happen to kick somebody in the head. Yeah, it's, uh, it's inevitable, and we just get used to it. In fact, it's kind of fun, uh, you know, when uh, somebody's in the interdeck access, for instance, and, and you want to head up, uh, even though it's small, there's always room, and you bump a little bit, and uh, it's kind of like bumper pool, but the forces are so light that it's really not very bothersome at all. It's kind of fun. Your colleague and my college astronomy classmate, Jeff Hoffman, uh, describes going to sleep on the orbiter as uh, being enveloped in a chrysalis, and he said he made the first proper brewed tea off the Earth. Any wonder-filled observations like that you're going to bring back? Can you share those with us? Well, there's a few things. We're... Uh, we had some tortillas on board, fresh tortillas, and uh, we built a little refrigerator out of one of the cold plates, and that's kept them fresh. I'll pass it off to uh, Bill Gregory. I have to work for a second here. Yeah, you caught us at an opportune time. We're coming at, to the end of a viewing cycle, and currently we're about ready to maneuver. Uh, what we've got is we've terminated the run with Ron Paris determining the data take, and now on directly behind me, John Grunsfeld is going to go ahead and gimbal lock the IPS, which is our pointing system, at which point we're going to go ahead and maneuver the orbiter in its entirety to the next area for the target. So what we're going to do is we're going to point the orbiter at the target. Once we're pointing the vehicle within a degree of the target, then the inertial pointing system, the IPS, will fine-tune on the stars. Once we've got that fine-tuned, then we go ahead and we start taking data again. Colonel Gregory, you and your crewmates are seeing farther out and longer ago than anybody before ever. You're the, really the product and the project right now of everyone who's ever been born. How do you feel about that? Well, I think I can echo everyone's feelings that we're just up here doing our job. We feel very privileged to have this opportunity to serve the American people and also the folks in the entire world. And we're very happy to be up here. We're trying to do the best job we can, and we think that the data we're going to provide the scientists will be information that they can crunch on for years to come. I see that Dr. Paris and Dr. Grunsfeld are back. Uh, as you know, there's extreme pressure on NASA's budget in Washington right now. Do you have a message from space for Washington and the citizens of planet Earth about the value of what you're doing, space research and exploration? Well, the, uh, the NASA astrophysics program and space research in general is really our only opportunity to explore the space that we have you know, outside of planet Earth and, and the astronomy program in particular to, to explore what's beyond the solar system. And uh, that's just very important research and it, it's brought a lot of developments uh, the detectors that we have on board have led to uh, new, 
new detection techniques for the medical industry, and overall it's a win-win situation. Uh, as far as the uh, shuttle program, uh, this is just the absolutely most fantastic flying vehicle there is. The kind of things we do up here, that it's uh, an entire living system, but also uh, you know, a spaceship, uh, I'm just amazed. And, and I've been training on this for three years, and I had no idea how pleased I'd be with the vehicle, and it's just performed flawlessly. And so this, this is a program that's worth supporting. Any closing thoughts from Colonel Gregory and Dr. Paris? Well, I just want to echo uh, John's feelings. And what a wonderful vehicle this is. It's amazing how uh, well it performed on the ascent. It was just flawless. We just sat back and enjoyed the ride. And although some missions perhaps are a little flasher and photogenic, I'm proud to be up here for 16 days delivering a bunch of science. And I think that uh, in the years to come, we're going to be very thrilled with the information that we're bringing back to Earth on this mission. And finally, Dr. Fariz. Well, I'd just like to add one comment about, about us being up here taking uh, all this exciting data. We're, of course, just the tip of the iceberg, and uh, there are several hundred more people on the ground who are planning um, and, uh, and taking the data that we send down. And so, uh, of course, um, they are working very long, hard hours, just as we are up here, and uh, deserve uh, much of the credit for what we get done. Gentlemen, thank you all. Houston, KFWB, that concludes the event. Thank you. Goodbye. Thanks, KFWB. Endeavor, let's resume operational air to ground one.